Hey Noah, what do you get when you cross a rhinoceros with an elephant? Elephino. <laughs> get it? Elephant, rhinoceros, elephino. It's a, you know, portmanteau. You blend two words together. Duh. Once again, to Tom's Hit Parade. Yes, the uh, regular wave that I do at the beginning of each video is, just feels like it's getting a little old, so I thought I'd try mixing it up a little bit. But anyway, yes, you read right the title of this video. I am doing a Backtracks video before the last few days of the month. Wow, you, uh, what a concept. A pre-Thanksgiving miracle, right? Anyway, uh, yes, yeah, so we'll see if I can keep this uh, trend going on into the, uh, the new year. Hopefully do Backtracks closer to the beginning of the month. That's like I've been wanting to do all along, but just... It just happens that I don't get to it until the end of the month, it seems, but I'm going to make a concerted effort to uh, bring Backtracks toward the beginning of the month. But anyway, yes, Backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five. So let's just uh, plunge headlong into the abyss and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of November 2019. In November of 1959, Perry Como released his first Christmas album, Season's Greetings from Perry Como. Backed by the Ray Charles Singers, the album features Como's renditions of holiday classics such as Oh Holy Night, There's No Place Like Home for the Holidays, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. His medley of Here We Come a Caroling and We Wish You a Merry Christmas was arranged by Ray Charles. Also released six decades ago this month was Latin Affair by the George Shearing Quintet. It includes Afro-Cuban flavored jazz renditions of such songs as All or Nothing at All, the Gershwin classic Let's Call the Whole Thing Off, and the Rodgers and Hart tune It's Easy to Remember. Featured musicians on the album include renowned guitarist Toots Thielemans and conga player Armando Peraza, who would go on to be a key member of Santana in the 1970s. 55 years ago this month, Chuck Berry released his seventh studio album, St. Louis to Liverpool. It was his first album to chart on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 124. It was also his first album released after serving 20 months in prison, during which time his music had become popular cover material for British invasion bands, thus sparking anticipation for new material from Barry. This album yielded a top 10 hit, No Particular Place to Go, the top 20 You Never Can Tell, as well as Little Marie and Promised Land. November of 1964 also saw the release of The Hollies' sophomore album in the Holly style. It was their second album recorded at EMI Studios, which would later be called Abbey Road Studios, but was their first to consist mostly of original material written by the band. Although it does include some pop hits made famous by other artists, such as Too Much Monkey Business by Chuck Berry, Nitty Gritty by Etta James, and It's In Her Kiss, also known as the Shoop Shoop Song. It didn't chart in the UK, and I couldn't find that any singles were ever released to promote it, uh, and there was never a US release of the album, and it wasn't released in Canada until almost a year later, with a modified track list, after the band's third album dropped in the UK. Happy 50th anniversary this month to the Allman Brothers Band's self-titled debut album. It was recorded and mixed in just two weeks, and includes the single Black Hearted Woman, a cover of Muddy Waters' Trouble No More, and the fan favorite song Whipping Post. Although critically acclaimed, the album sold poorly and barely cracked the Billboard 200. Tom Dowd was originally scheduled to produce the album, but was unavailable at the time, so Adrian Barber took his place. When this album and the follow-up Idlewild South were re-released in 1973 to capitalize on the band's recent surge in popularity, Dowd was brought back in to remix the project, entitled Beginnings, which went on to peak at number 25 on the Billboard 200. Also released in November of 1969 was Rod Stewart's debut album, The Rod Stewart Album. It spent 16 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number 139. The album's most successful single was Handbags and Glad Rags, although it didn't achieve that success until it was re-released in 1972, peaking at number 42 on the Billboard Hot 100. Among the musicians who worked on the album were Keith Emerson of Emerson, Lake & Palmer, and Stewart's Faces bandmate and future Rolling Stone, Ronnie Wood. By coincidence, the album's opening track was a cover of the recent Rolling Stones single, Street Fighting Man. The album was released three months later in the UK under the title An Old Raincoat Won't Ever Let You Down. November of 1974 saw the release of Queen's third album, Sheer Heart Attack. It was the band's first album to crack the top 20 of the Billboard 200, peaking at number 12. It reached number 2 in the UK and was a top 10 album in Canada, France, the Netherlands, and Norway. Several publications include the album in all-time lists including Kerrang, Mojo, NME, and Rolling Stone. 
The album's first single, Killer Queen, reached number two in the UK and was the band's first top 20 hit in the US, reaching number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100. Yes, the same peak positions as the album on their corresponding country's charts. Weird, huh? Anyway, uh, other notable tracks on the album include Flick of the Wrist, Brighton Rock, and Stone Cold Crazy. Also released 45 years ago this month was Roxy Music's fourth album, Country Life. It peaked at number three on the UK album charts and was the band's first top 40 album in the US, reaching number 37 on the Billboard 200. Three singles were released from the album. The only one to chart was All I Want Is You, which reached number 12 on the UK chart. This was one of four Roxy Music albums to make Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. 40 years ago this month, Pink Floyd released their 11th album, The Wall. It topped the Billboard 200 chart for 15 weeks and was a number one album in Canada, Australia, and seven other countries, but it only reached number three in the band's native UK. As of January 1999, it carries a 23 times platinum certification in the US. The album spawned the band's only number one single in the US and the UK, Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2, which also reached number one in 13 other countries. Other singles from the album include Run Like Hell and Comfortably Numb. The concept album was adapted into a 1982 feature film of the same name. Also released in November of 1979 was Willie Nelson's 24th album and first Christmas album, Pretty Paper. It peaked at number 11 on the Billboard Country Albums chart and number 73 on the Billboard 200. Booker T. Jones, who produced Nelson's Stardust album the previous year, returned for this set of holiday standards including White Christmas, Frosty the Snowman, Jingle Bells, and Little Town of Bethlehem. The album was bookended by two originals, the title track, written by Willie Nelson but made popular 16 years earlier by Roy Orbison, and the instrumental Christmas Blues. November of 1984 saw the release of Brian Adams' fourth album, Reckless. It peaked at number one in the US and Adams' native Canada, number two in Australia and Norway, and was a top 10 album in the UK and Sweden. It was the first album ever to sell more than 1 million copies within Canada and holds a diamond certification there, as well as five times platinum certification in the US. It became just the third album in Billboard Hot 100 history, after Michael Jackson's Thriller and Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA, to have six singles chart within the top 15. Heaven hit number one, Run to You and Summer of 69 landed in the top 10. Somebody, One Night Love Affair, and It's Only Love, a duet with Tina Turner, also broke the top 15. All six singles hit the top 20 of the Canadian singles chart. Also released 35 years ago this month was REO Speedwagon's 11th album, Wheels Are Turnin'. It peaked at number 7 on the Billboard 200 and is tied with Good Trouble as the band's second best-selling album, after High Infidelity. Its success was propelled by the smash hit single Can't Fight This Feeling, which became the band's longest-running number one single on the Billboard Hot 100, spending three weeks at the top out of 18 weeks on the chart. It was also a number one single in Canada, reached number two in Australia, number eight in South Africa, and number 16 on the UK singles chart. The album's other three singles, I Don't Want to Know, One Lonely Night, and Live Every Moment, all peaked in the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. Three decades ago this month, Technotronic released their debut album, Pump Up the Jam. It peaked at number two on the UK albums chart and number 10 on the Billboard 200, holding platinum certifications in both countries. It was also a top 10 album in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. The first single, the album's title track, hit number two in the US, the UK, and four other countries, and was a top 10 single in several others. The follow-up single, Get Up Before the Night is Over, hit number one in Switzerland, number two in the UK, Germany, and France, and was a top 10 hit in the US, Australia, and elsewhere. Both singles hit number two in the Netherlands and number one in the group's native Belgium. Also released in November of 1989 was Whitesnake's eighth album, Slip of the Tongue. It topped the album's chart in Finland and peaked at number 10 on both the Billboard 200 and the UK album's chart. It holds a platinum certification in the US. Singles Fool for Your Loving and The Deeper the Love reached the top five of the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart and the top 40 of the Canadian singles charts. The Deeper the Love and subsequent single Now You're Gone made the UK top 40. As a trivia note, when original guitarist Adrian Vandenberg was unable to record for the album, frontman David Coverdale recruited noted guitarist Steve Vai, based not on his work with Frank Zappa and David Lee Roth, among others, but rather on his appearance in the 1986 drama film Crossroads. A quarter of a century ago this month saw the release of Nirvana's MTV Unplugged in New York. Recorded less than five months before the death of frontman Kurt Cobain, this live set features all acoustic renditions of Nirvana classics and a handful of covers including David Bowie's The Man Who Sold the World. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and holds five times platinum certification in the US, and topped the album's charts in ten other countries. 
It's included in many best of lists, such as NME's 50 Greatest Live Albums, Rolling Stone's Greatest Albums of All Time, and the book 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. It also won the Grammy Award for Best Alternative Music Album. Also released in November of 1994 was Merry Christmas by Mariah Carey. Among the top 10 all-time best-selling Christmas albums in the U.S., it peaked at number 3 on the Billboard 200 and spent 8 weeks in the top 20. In October of this year, it was certified 6 times platinum by the RIAA. The lead single from the album, the modern-day classic All I Want for Christmas Is You, stands as one of the best-selling holiday singles of all time and the best-selling holiday single by a female artist. It topped the charts in 20 countries and was top 10 in more than a dozen others. The rest of the album consists of a mixture of traditional carols such as Joy to the World and Silent Night, and more recent classics like Christmas, Baby Please Come Home, and Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Celebrating its 20th birthday this month is S&M by Metallica. Recorded live over two nights, the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra plays alongside Metallica, performing accompaniment written and conducted by the late Michael Kamen. It features totally epic orchestra-backed renditions of two new songs, plus 18 Metallica classics such as Master of Puppets, Enter Sandman, Nothing Else Matters, and The Call of Cthulhu, which won a Grammy for Best Rock Instrumental Performance. The album currently enjoys five times platinum certification in the U.S. and has sold 8 million copies worldwide. The idea for the concert was first conceived years earlier by original Metallica bassist Cliff Burton. And can I just say something here? I am not a Metallica fan or a fan of metal in general, but this album kicks ass. Seriously. It raises these songs to a completely different level. Uh, I mean, honestly, if you have not listened to this album, I urge you strongly to listen to it. This is one of my favorite albums of the 90s, by far. Also released in November of 1999 was Enrique the fourth overall album and first English-language album by Enrique Iglesias. It spent almost a year on the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number 33. It topped the album chart in Spain, reached number 3 in Mexico, and was a top 10 album in Norway, Canada, Germany, and Brazil. The album produced two number 1 Billboard Hot 100 singles, Bailamos and Be With You, both of which hit number 2 on the Canadian charts. Rhythm Divine was a top 10 hit in Canada and a top 40 single in the U.S. Could I Have This Kiss Forever, a duet with Whitney Houston, was a number one hit in the Netherlands and Switzerland, and also went top ten in Canada. The album also features both English and Spanish renditions of the Bruce Springsteen song, Sad Eyes. Fifteen years ago this month, Kenny G released his 13th studio album, At Last, the Duets album. It reached number 40 on the Billboard 200, number 21 on the Billboard R&B Hip Hop Albums chart, and number one on the Contemporary Jazz chart. It features an array of notable guest artists joining him in renditions of chart hits such as Christina Aguilera's Beautiful with Shaka Khan, Elton John's Sorry Seems to Be the Hardest Word with Richard Marks, Wham's Careless Whisper with Brian McKnight, and even the average white band's classic instrumental Pick Up the Pieces alongside fellow saxophonist David Sanborn. I Believe I Can Fly with Yolanda Adams and The Way You Move featuring Earth, Wind, and Fire reached the top 40 of the Billboard Adult Contemporary Singles Chart. Also released 15 years ago this month was Gwen Stefani's solo debut album, Love Angel Music Baby. It reached the top 10 of the album charts in 13 countries, number 1 in Australia, number 3 in Canada, number 4 in the UK, and number 5 in the US. Its most successful single was Hollaback Girl, which topped the singles charts in the US and Australia and was a top 5 hit in Austria, Germany, and New Zealand. The preceding single, Rich Girl, featuring Eve, was a top 10 hit in the US, Australia, and the UK, and several other countries. The album earned six Grammy nominations, including Album of the Year and Best Pop Vocal Album, with Hollaback Girl getting two nominations, Record of the Year and Best Female Pop Vocal Performance. Linda Perry and Andre 3000 also make contributions to the album. In November of 2009, Rihanna released her fourth album, Rated R. It peaked in the top ten in 15 countries, number four in the U.S., number five in Canada, and number one in Norway and Switzerland. It was included on ten best albums lists by critics from Entertainment Weekly, The Chicago Tribune, and Slate Magazine. Singles Russian Roulette and Rude Boy were top ten hits in several countries, including the U.S., the U.K., Germany, France, and New Zealand. The single Hard, featuring Jeezy, went top ten in the U.S. and Canada. With Rude Boy, Rihanna tied with Paula Abdul and Diana Ross for the fifth most number one singles on the Billboard Hot 100 by a female artist. The album also boasts contributions by Justin Timberlake, Will I Am, and Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash. Also released 10 years ago this month was Susan Boyle's debut album I Dreamed a Dream. 
Following her now legendary audition on Britain's Got Talent, which went viral on YouTube, the album was released to much anticipation. It topped the album's charts in 12 countries, including the US, the UK, Australia, and was a top 10 album in more than 10 others. In its debut week on the UK albums chart, it sold more copies than the rest of the top five combined. It was the biggest first week seller in the US of 2009, and within just the seven weeks that remained in the year, became the year's biggest selling album in the world. It featured an assortment of traditional hymns such as How Great Thou Art, classic pop hits like Daydream Believer and Wild Horses, and show tunes including the title track. And as a trivia note, Boyle actually finished second on Britain's Got Talent that year. Five years ago this month, Nick Jonas released his self-titled sophomore album. It peaked at number 6 on the Billboard 200 and was a top 20 album in Canada, the UK, and Mexico. Lead-off single Chains was a top 20 hit on the Billboard Hot 100 and a top 40 hit in Canada. Follow-up single Jealous was even more successful, hitting the top 10 in the US, Canada, the UK, and New Zealand, and going top 20 in Australia. Demi Lovato made an appearance on the album track Avalanche, and Mike Posner contributed to the song Closer on the deluxe version of the album. Also released in November of 2014 was The Foo Fighters' eighth album, Sonic Highways. Featuring contributions from artists such as The Eagles' Joe Walsh, The Preservation Hall Jazz Band, Gary Clark Jr., and Zach Brown, the album peaked at number two on the Billboard 200. Frontman Dave Grohl and producer Butch Vig chronicled the creative process of the album, including interviews with producers and musicians, for a documentary miniseries that was shown on the HBO network. And can I just say for a minute, I love the cover art for this album. I've never heard it, but I just absolutely love the cover art. I would love to have like one of those big four foot by four foot posters of that on my wall. Just, just fantastic art. Okay, are you guys ready for some spotlight albums? I know I am. Uh, these, I've got two of them this month, and they were actually both released in November of 1974, so they're both 45 years old this month. Uh, first one is the fourth album by Ringo Starr, Good Night Vienna. And this, counting his latest album, which just came out this month or last month, uh, What's My Name, I think is the name of it. Uh, this is actually my, counting that album, this is my second full album exposure to Ringo Starr. Uh, I am very passingly familiar with uh, John Lennon's biggest singles. I don't have any of his albums. And I've got a couple of uh, uh, Paul McCartney's albums from the 80s, of course, being an 80s kid. And I've also got one uh, George Harrison album. So I'm not very familiar at all with the Beatles solo projects, but I have a feeling that Ringo Starr is the Beatle whose solo work I would probably cotton to the most, uh, even though he is, yes, the most lighthearted, ear fluff if you will, uh, artist of, you know, that was formerly associated with the Beatles. So, you know, hopefully that doesn't make you think any less of me with regard to my music taste, but, uh, you know, that that's what it is, I guess. Uh, but then again, you know, disclaimer, I've only gotten s so far in Beatles solo stuff, so that could change. But anyway, I really enjoyed this album. Uh, this, by the way, this was a top 10 album in the U.S., top 20 in Canada, and it hit number 30 in the U.K. Just uh, thought I'd mention that. And uh, yeah, I really... As I said, I really, really enjoyed this album. It did feature a contribution by John Lennon. Uh, he wrote the opening track, the title track, Good Night Vienna. Uh, very nice, bouncy, very much a Beatles-esque song, as, is, as are most of the al songs on this album. Uh, and there, the songwriting credits on this album are pretty remarkable. There's a song by Alan Toussaint. Uh, he covers. Uh, he actually does a song written by El Elton John and Bernie Taupin, which was never released uh, at, by Elton John himself. So it's a first recording of an Elton John and Bertie Thompson song. Uh, he covers songs by Hoyt Axton, Harry Nilsson. At least I assume the song Easy For Me by Harry Nilsson was it pre previously recorded by Nilsson? I'm not sure. And anyway, also he does a song by uh, Roger Miller, Husbands and Wives. That's a very good song. I mean, all the songs on this album are, are, are pretty darn good in, in my opinion. I, th I think I would really enjoy dipping further into uh, Ringo Starr's past uh, pr uh, discography. Uh, the song Ooh Wee, which is on the f side one, it, it's a Ringo Starr original, but the verses in the song s are a little bit too similar in, for my taste to the song Fever by Peggy Lee. So, you know, take that for what you will. Uh, but, you know, still, it was, a, it was a fairly enjoyable song on its own merits. And uh, the song Only You, which was a 50s uh, pop and R&B hit, uh, Only You and You Alone, it was done by some doo-wop groups back then. Uh, that's uh, he covers that on this album. It's a really good, uh, a good rendition of it, and uh, I enjoyed this album quite a bit, honestly, uh, more than I expected I would. Uh, but yeah, and you know, as I said, with this one and 
what's my name I think I'm really going to enjoy uh, dipping further into Ringo Starr but yeah several of the songs as I said have a, a bit of a, a Beatles-esque kind of a mid-period Beatles bounce to them uh, Snookaroo which was the which is the Elton John Bernie Taupin song that's that's a pretty fun one and uh, Uwe Acapella which is a song written by Alan Toussaint I think I said that I'm not sure if I did already or not uh, and then All By Myself, which is another uh, Ringo Starr original. He actually wrote, I believe, three of the songs on this album. All the other ones were written by other songwriters or are covers of other songwriters' album, uh, songs. What can I say but uh, the fact that I enjoyed this album, I am happy to add it to my vinyl collection. Uh, so yeah, I am definitely going to enjoy dipping further into Ringo's discography. So yeah, very good album. And now on to the second Spotlight album this month. It is the fifth album by Linda Ronstadt, Heart Like a Wheel. This was actually her most successful album uh, to date. It was her first to reach number one on the Billboard 200. It actually received a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year. Uh, there's uh, trivia notes for you. And uh, one other thing that attracted me to this album was it features uh, Eagles members Glenn Fry and Don Henley and sometime Eagle Timothy B. Schmidt uh, in her backing band. And this was something that she did uh, pretty regularly. Uh, I, I think it was more in touring than on albums, but yeah, she frequently used the Eagles in whole or in part for her backing band. So that, that in my opinion, that's just one more reason to like it, as I said. Uh, but yeah, it's a, a bunch of good songs on this album. This features uh, the opening track is You're No Good, which was one of her biggest hits ever. Uh, and let's see, uh, she covers a song by, or a does a song written by Paul Anka. I'm not sure if it, he recorded it previously or not. It doesn't matter anymore. That's a very, very good song. Uh, does a song by J.D. Is it Souther or Souther? J.D. Souther or J.D. Souther? I'm not sure. Uh, let me know which it is, if any of you know out there. Uh, and uh, a song, the title track, Heart Like a Wheel, is written by Anna McGarrigal, who is Rufus Wainwright's mother or aunt. I can't remember, but uh, anyway. Big help I am, huh? Uh, side 2 opens with a, an Everly Brothers song written by Phil, uh, Phil Everly, When Will I Be Loved. That's a beautiful song. I love that one. It's one of my favorites on the album. Uh, I Can't Help It If I'm Still In Love With You, written by Hank Williams. That's on this album. That's another standout. And I think that was a single also. And then she closes the album with a song but written by James Taylor, uh, You Can Close Your Eyes. And, of course, being a song by James Taylor is just beautiful, lovely song. So yeah, I, I'm not sure which of these two albums I like more. I think it's, it's a pretty dead even tie on this on these this pair of albums. But yeah, it's just uh, this is a great album. I can, I can see why it was her most successful and why it was nominated for an Album of the Year Grammy. It's just a great, great album. So yeah, those reviews went kind of quick, didn't they? Uh, I, I, I keep insisting I am not the best person to do album reviews. I, I don't know, what do you guys think? Uh, <laughs> But yet, it's, it's sometimes, sometimes, no matter how much you love an album, there's only so much you can say about it. And uh, I, I'm sure I've said that before in, in past videos, but uh, sometimes I just have a hard time expressing why I like an album so much. What can I say? But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this Backtracks for the month of November. It's in the books. There's just one more month of the year. Can you believe that? Uh, crazy, crazy. Anyway, uh, that is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, suggestions, questions, constructive criticisms? Lay them on me in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.